That deserves an amen, doesn't it? It is beautiful to have, well, it's beautiful to have your faces in the sanctuary. It is beautiful to have music with us, and it is a beautiful day to come and celebrate this wonderful season that we find ourselves going through the 40 days of Lent in preparation as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls to come to the cross at Easter tide. Welcome everyone to Grandview United Methodist. If you are joining us as a guest, maybe in person and or online after the fact, please know that you are especially welcome and we are so glad that you have chose to worship with us on this beautiful rainy, misty, wonderful spring day that God has made. Uh, a couple of announcements as we begin. A reminder that our station at the back is there for our offering as a as a way to keep from passing things between one another and, and, and reducing the number of contacts that we have uh, here in the sanctuary. We would invite you to pause there to reflect on your generosity uh, if you have not already. And we also have back there our glass mission mug. So if you've got some pocket change that you'd like to unload, that goes directly towards the missional work that we do. Uh, today, at the fourth Sunday of Lent, today is also Encore Sunday. Um, that is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. If you're not familiar with Encore, please do a quick Google search. Do yourself a favor because they are an incredible group. Anytime there is distress in the world, anytime there is a, a, a major uh, 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 weather event or a catastrophe, Encore is one of the first groups always on the ground to be there to respond to people's immediate needs and help them through crisis times. And so this morning, as we reflect on our generosity, if you would like to make an extra gift and know that that goes to Encore, we would encourage you to do so. Uh, also, uh, Food Pantry Sunday. Was there anything in particular that we're trying to collect this week? Does anybody know? No? Did, items for the food pantry, as always, an important thing, but especially in the last year. I know our food pantry in Winfield has... Um, certainly seen an, seen an increased need. Um, so any way that we as Christians can respond and act on that is right and good. Upcoming, we have March 18th, Finance will meet at 7 p.m. here at the church, I believe, correct? And then we will have worship and Acts 1-8 uh, meetings upcoming. And last but not least, sign-up boards are back out in the uh, foyer for uh, doing liturgists and Carol, thank you for doing that this morning, and then also for uh, children's moments, and Mary, thank you so much, but I know you all would love to share those responsibilities with others, so please sign up and, and make yourself available for those. Any other announcements we can bring for the good of the body this morning? If not, then I would invite, oh, wait, hold on. Birthdays? Is that right? Second. Is it really? <laughs> I'm so out of routine. <laughs> birthdays this month, March birthdays. Who's got birthdays? Anybody in the house? Okay, well, if it's your birthday and you're not with us this morning, very, very happy birthday to you, and we are celebrating you as we do all month long. Then I would ask you, as we roll forward, to stand and join in our call to worship on the screen this morning. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Let us act justly. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. Let us love tenderly. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Let us fall humbly with our God. May we see Christ in one another. That we may be healers and peacemakers in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You be seated and join me in a word of prayer. O oh God, you are so you so love the world as to give your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grant to us the precious gift of faith, that we may know that the Son of God is come, 
and may have power to overcome the world and gain a blessed immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you would stand and we'll join together in our opening hymn to God be the glory on page 98 of our hymns. to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. So, time for our children. <laughs> to read to you this morning. All of these are sort of simple books, but you got to get simple books to have short enough to do in children's sermons. 
And it's another one about Easter. And then we're going to talk about my egg that I have for this morning. I'm going to have eggs every Sunday for you that have, have a little different meaning. So this one is called Rufus and Ryan Celebrate Easter. Ryan spins around with excitement. Easter is coming, Rufus. Do you have a stuffed animal that you talk to? No. No? I do. <laughs> well, Ryan did, and Rufus was his stuffed animal. It's time to color eggs. Rufus is not much help. Ryan climbs into Daddy's lap. What is Easter, he asks. Good question, Daddy says. Easter is about Jesus, God's son. Jesus loves us, Ryan says. I learned that at church. Yes, Mama says, you are right. I love Jesus too, says Ryan. At Easter, we remember how Jesus died, says Daddy. That makes me sad. Ryan hugs Rufus. Daddy smiles and says, but that's not the end of the story. On Easter morning, God did something amazing. He made Jesus live again. That's why Easter is the best day. Jesus is alive now, says Mama. He will never die again. And because we love Jesus, we will live with him in heaven one day. I like Easter, says Ryan. I'm glad Jesus is alive. Isn't that right, Rufus? Jesus loved you, too. <clears throat> On Easter morning, everyone goes to church. All the people are smiling. Easter is a happy, happy day. Jesus is alive, says the pastor. Hallelujah, the people answer. That means praise God, hooray, says Mama. Alleluia and hooray, says Ryan. Back at home, Ryan finds his Easter basket. Inside are colored eggs, jelly beans, and a baseball. And Rufus is in the basket. Happy Easter, everyone. So we go to church to learn about the story of Jesus' birth. And then at this time of the year, we learn about the, the story of his death and how he came to live again. And I opened up this Easter egg so I can show you what's inside of it, and then I'll give you one. But this is called, My Faith is Built on Jesus. And we come to church and Sunday school to learn about Jesus and how our faith grows by learning more about him. And inside this egg today are a few Legos. Do you have Legos at home? And there's just enough that if you follow the pattern here on the, the seal from the egg, you can make a cross out of it. So you can take this egg home with you and make that cross this week and have it somewhere in your room or or where it will remind you about why we come to church why we study about jesus and what is special about easter okay let's bow our heads in prayer and then each of you can take an egg dear god dear god thank you so much thank you so much for sending your son jesus for sending your son jesus to die on the cross die on the cross and arise again and arise again for us for us and still in us and still in us a love of Jesus a love of Jesus in your name we pray in your name we pray amen amen okay and here's an egg for each of you, or what color do you want? Since there's only the two, let's see, I've got green, blue, orange. Maybe that one's a, a red one. 
Which? Blue. Blue? What do you want, Bristol? Uh, green. Green? Okay, there you go. Do you want to take one for Braley? Yeah. Other Bristol? What color do you want to take for her? Red. Okay, do you want to take yeah, it, three of them home? Yeah, if you'll just leave three right there, we'll take them home. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. It's now time for our New Testament <clears throat> reading. And we'll find that in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, would you join me in an attitude of prayer? Gracious Creator, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts gathered here in person and watching from home be acceptable in your sight. For you, God, are our rock, and you are our strength, and you are our Redeemer. Amen. I just want to name something that came to me just a moment ago when we were uh, doing the children's time, and that is that it is beautiful that we <coughs> recite the prayer together. And why is that beautiful to me? Well, because if I took a poll right now, I would say that there's a good portion of us that are not comfortable praying, especially in public. And so this act of teaching our kids what it's like to pray and respond to God openly um, is a beautiful thing. And so Mary, thank you for, for leading us in that. So this morning scripture, is fairly familiar, right? Because if I began by saying, for God so loved the world, you would respond, that he gave his only begotten son. Exactly. It's very familiar to our ear, right? Now, I don't personally have the ability to, chat, to quote chapter and verse much of our sacred text. I know that might shock you. The pastor doesn't know all chapter and verse. That's just true. I just don't. But I would fancy a guess that most of us could cite this as one of the most recognizable scriptures of our holy text, right? Perhaps only equaled or maybe even eclipsed by the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now I know a lot of Christians, especially those who uh, are in my parents or even my grandparents' generations, who could quote chapter and verse like saying their own name, right? And there's many factors around that, including literacy rates and di different generations and cultural practices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those things may help explain why it is less common today. However, I also need to name that some of the most pious and hypocritical professing Christians I have ever met are those who can quote chapter and verse those things can exist simultaneously. So this week I was reflecting on sort of the regularity of this verse, sort of how common it is for us, and why it might be that we have this sort of imbalance of 
uh, of, of the, that experience that I just described for you. And it had me thinking back to my college days as an opera major at Wichita State. This will make sense in a minute, so just go along with me. See, part of my training as an opera singer was to learn about foreign languages, right? I regularly sang in Italian and German, French, sometimes even Russian and many others. So to train for this, we were taught and we were encouraged to learn two different skill sets. The first was diction. Now diction basically means to master the proper pronunciation of words. Knowing where the accents would lie for a native speaker to where when I sang it, it sounded like the native language to someone who would speak it. That means that when I sang an Italian art song like Seven Crudere, a listener who spoke Italian could hear the words and understand them. See, for us, to kind of put it into English terms, it would be like hearing a non-native English speaker singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, but if their words sounded more like Amazing Grace, Who Sweet the Sun. Right words. We'd know what the song was, but we would know for sure that that person did not know what those words meant, and we would know for sure that they were not a native English speaker. The other skill we were encouraged to acquire was actually taking foreign language courses, learning not only the diction, but the translations. To the native ear, it is always clear when someone as a singer knows not only how to pronounce properly inflection, but when they also connect the language and the meaning of the words, the mood message. So this is the parallel that I've been pouring over this week. John 3.16 is so memorized, it's so internalized for us, we absolutely know it by rote, but do we simply know the diction? Or do we understand its meaning? And not only the meaning of John 3.16, but the meaning of John 3.16 in the context of John 3.15 and 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 and 21. Do we understand it as a part of the story of the book of the Gospel of John? Three sixteen really is a sweet and simple message, and I think that's why it's so favorite. God loves the world. Just believe in Jesus. It's beautiful. But it starts to get a little darker in 17. See, in 17 we read that, Indeed, God didn't send the Son to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. Well, okay. Saving us is good. Not quite as sweet as 16, but I'm still with you, John. Then 18, he drops a bomb on us, doesn't he? Those who believe are not condemned, but those who don't are condemned already. Now, whoa, John. We went from loving God to condemnation in like a split second there. Slow down. The 19 to 21 is really the nail in the coffin, right? Light is in the world and came as Jesus. Those who do evil hate the light and are already condemned. Those who do what is true have already come to the light. A couple of things to unpack here. First, those last couple of lines, our author and John seems to suggest that good doers and evil doers are sort of already predetermined. Let me say that again. He seems to suggest that good doers and evil doers are predetermined. Those who do good already go towards the light, and those who do evil are already condemned. And I promise, I went back and I looked at the original language to try to see if this was a sort of misinterpretation. It's really not. Those are the really the best interpretation we have in English, is that they are already condemned. Now, 
I believe that God has a master plan at work in all of creation. And simultaneously, I wholesale reject the idea of predetermination. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that I don't believe that all of our actions are predetermined for us. I believe in free will. Believing that all things have already been decided for us flies in the face of the concept of free will that was given to us by God. See, if free will didn't exist and predetermination was really the order of the day, then Eve was created specifically for the purpose of sinning, Adam was created specifically to follow her, and God made it all happen so he could be mad at them for what he made them to do. Doesn't sound like the God I know. So sorry, I'm, I'm not on board with predetermination. I just can't go there. But perhaps that's not what John is really trying to say here to us, though. So let's take another step back to 17 again. God didn't send the light Jesus to condemn, but to save. Okay, well, if there's a possibility of being saved, then through that salvation, it must mean that we each have choices, right? Okay, John, I'm back with you. So then what? Well, there's always a possibility that a verse isn't intended for us as the audience, as we know. But maybe this verse is meant for us. But maybe just not in the way that we've become so comfortable understanding it. For God so loved the world, Jesus was sent to be the light and salvation. Perhaps that is instead a call to action for us. Those of us who have already seen the light. See, in the season that we're going through right now of repentance and reflection, kind of gives me a lens for all the scripture I'm reading at this point. So the question came to me is that if I am a person who tunes towards the light, how can I look on my neighbors, my friends, co-workers, family, knowing this light, and how can I allow them to remain in the darkness? See, if we truly understand the gravity of this passage from John this morning, how could we not spend every waking hour telling anyone who would listen that there is a light for them here. And all they need to do is step in and they too can have life everlasting. How could we keep that message of hope from anyone? See, if I truly believe that, I couldn't keep such good news from my worst enemy. Nevertheless, someone who I love or I care about, or even someone I'm just neutral to, someone I've never met before. So here's the hard part. And what does that mean? Well, perhaps it means that I don't take it to heart as earnestly as I should. Perhaps that's why my waking hours aren't consumed with sharing the good news with anyone who has ears to hear. Perhaps I don't quite believe it as much as I say I do or as much perhaps as I want to. And if that's so, am I really living in the light? Or am I just light adjacent? Comfortable knowing that I can recite my John 3.16 and say that God loves me, but not actually having to act on it. It reminded me of a hymn. It's actually one of Terry's favorites. The hymn's titled, How Can I Keep From Singing? My life goes on in endless song. 
above Earth's lamentation. I hear the real, though far off him, that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear its music ringing. It sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? While through the, though the tempest loudly roars, I hear the truth, it liveth. And through, though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble in their fear and hear their death knell ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? In prison cell and dungeon vile, our thoughts to them are winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? If we truly know this light, how can we keep ourselves from singing? How can we keep from proclaiming? How can we keep living like people who are not changed by this great news that the light is in the world? It's in the world for you, it's in the world for me, it's in the world for your neighbor, for your friend, for your enemy, for people you've never met. It's in the world for all of creation. So in these 40 days, let us spend time reflecting what are the things that keep us from singing? Singing this good news from the mountaintops? Let us repent for those sins and prepare our hearts as we approach the cross. And do it all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, we come recognizing two things that we know to be true. First, we fall short. We keep ourselves from sin. And second, the grace of Jesus Christ came to us before we ever needed it. So let's join now in our common confession on the screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, hear this really good news. The light is in the world. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. Amen. Amen.
the suffer. Um, we maintain attitudes of love and graciousness and we hold prayer space for places that we know that words just don't do enough. Um, we have a loving God, a God who loved us with such intensity that God sent Jesus to show that love, to show that mercy, to show that care. Let's go now in an attitude of prayer. Most gracious Creator, Heavenly Redeemer, Abba, Father, we, your children, we suffer. We pain. We yearn for renewal. We yearn for peace. And yet, as much as we yearn for these things, sometimes we use words and have thoughts of division. We use words and have thoughts of harm, of anger, of spite, of getting ahead, of getting one over, We know these thoughts don't come and flow from you, God. We also have thoughts of apathy, excuses that allow us to remain comfortably adjacent to the life instead of leaning fully into the grace that you offer us so freely. Lord, remove from us the things that keep us from singing. Remove from us the things that silence our voice. Let us recognize what those things are and let us lay them at your feet. Let us bring them to you in confession and repentance that as we approach the great, glorious Easter morning, the morning that we celebrate our risen Savior, that no force on this earth could ever keep us from seeing it. Fill our hearts with comfort. Fill our hearts with joy. And know, Lord, we, we know that comfort and joy don't mean that sadness will not visit us. No, that is not the way it works. But let us be joy-filled. And let us be comfort to others. Let us do all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. My friends, we have traveled a journey. Like the 40 days that we are on each Sunday of this season is a time, to, a moment in time to pause, a moment in time to reflect, and a moment in time to give introspection. So as we go forward from this place, go forward with peace, go forward with courage, go forward with love, Go knowing 
that you have every opportunity to be near the light and do not stop yourself from sinning. Amen. Thank you.